Unless you're David Blaine, being frozen in a block of ice probably sounds terrible. Luckily for today's video, computer parts don't have feelings. At least not yet. So we can freeze them in a block of ice without remorse. And the question of the day is, which computer parts can survive being frozen in a block of ice and which ones will perish. The setup for this experiment is pretty straightforward. First, I need to find a container large enough to fit some PC parts. No, those are sausages. Nah, that one's too small. Ah, this one that I placed here two minutes ago. Perfect. Now it's time to select the victims, I mean volunteers, for today's experiment. Which of you computer parts want a volunteer to be frozen? All right, no volunteers, victims it is. I grabbed an older GPU as well as a slightly more modern one so we could compare how the different heat sinks are affected by the ice. Also grabbed some RAM and a mouse, which I think will be super interesting, as well as a hard drive, and then a full-on CPU motherboard and RAM combo as well. And with our Avengers assembled, it's time to open the floodgates. At this point, only a thumbs up from the Emperor can spare these poor PC parts. And the verdict? Thumbs down! As always, please don't try this at home. You know, technically, I think this is a soup. All right, and with all of these computer components successfully submerged in water and placed into the fridge, we need to wait overnight for it to freeze. In the meantime, what do you think will happen? How many of these parts do you think will continue to work after being frozen and thawed? For my guesses, I think the CPU, the RAM, the old graphics card, the mouse, and the motherboard will all work totally fine. On the other hand, I think that the newer graphics card and the hard drive have no chance of working whatsoever. Take a moment to think about which ones you think will survive and won't survive and leave a comment down below to lock in your answer. Day two. After its first night in the freezer, the water still isn't completely frozen. You can see some air bubbles still floating around underneath the surface. Day three. And just like that, after the second night of being in the freezer, our PC soup has turned into a PC popsicle. And boy, does it look delicious. Hmm. Refreshing. I grossly <coughs> underestimated how cold this would be. Thankfully, I have some tools to help me with step number five, which is somehow getting these PC parts out of the ice. Well, here goes nothing. This is proving to be much more difficult than I thought it was going to be. In my head, I was like, oh, I'll just smash the ice and then I'll take the parts out and test them. But I think I'm just gonna have to wait for this to all melt to get access to anything. And boy, did I have to wait. Thankfully, it was a super hot and sunny day outside, so I honestly just let the sun do most of the melting until I was able to pry off some of the components. The RAM, hard drive, and older GPU came off without much hassle, and check out this iced out heatsink. Pretty cool. The rest of the components were putting up much more of a fight. I was eventually able to tear out the mouse, which ended up being kind of fun because the buttons were still frozen and the cord was still stuck in the ice, so I just kind of played with that for a little bit. And then I got impatient and started yanking on the motherboard, ended up breaking off one of the heat sinks. Well, that's not good. This thing was super stuck. I had to call in some assistance for my dog, and even then we couldn't get it off. So I ended up just waiting till midnight until the motherboard easily came off, and then I gently disposed of the rest of the ice. And now, a couple days later, our PC parts are finally dry enough to test. So this is the final step of the experiment. Which of these will work, which ones won't? It's time to find out. Let's start by testing the older of the two graphics cards. Upon closer inspection, I'm not seeing a lot of water damage aside from this poor sticker getting torn in half but that's something I can live with. Just to date this GPU even further, it has a dual DVI-D output, which means I have to use this adapter. And now, the moment of truth. As we power on the system, we can see the GPU immediately spin to life. Look at that, no hesitation, this thing's still kicking. And after a moment, a signal pops on screen as well. Let's go. Granted, the display is funky because this GPU is super old, but that's incredible. <laughs> this is still working. Now that we know the older GPU works, let's try the more modern one to see if that still has any life in it. Similar to the last GPU, I'm not seeing any significant water damage on this one aside from some condensation still stuck underneath the wrapper. Honestly, wouldn't even be able to tell that this was frozen. This GPU does require some PCIe power, so let's plug that in. And now, let's see what happens as we power on the PC. Uh-oh, false start. You can see the fans pulsing as if they're trying to get running, but it just can't. Until eventually it does start running, but ends up producing one of the most ridiculous outputs that I've ever seen. What is that? That is a sure sign that something's wrong. In case it's not clear, this green static should definitely not be here. And while I was able to get to the Windows loading screen, eventually the card just decided to die completely, where finally an output display error was presented on screen. Now that's pretty interesting. Why do you think the newer of the two graphics cards doesn't work anymore, but the older one does? If anything, this is a cool way to highlight the difference of how these GPUs are cooled. 
If you take a look at the heatsink on top of this older GPU, you can see that it's basically just a bunch of plastic with a fan on top. Now compare that to the heatsink in this newer GPU. What do you see here? Metal pipes. These are used to help dissipate heat away from the actual chip in the GPU, but metal typically doesn't like the expansion of liquids inside of them, which is what happens when water freezes. Pretty cool display of an older piece of technology outdoing a newer one. And now it's time for the mouse. At this point, the buttons are clicking and firing as normal, but there is a bit of water trapped in the scroll wheel. Will that be enough to prevent the mouse from working? Well, as we plug in the mouse, we can see that its RGB does light up, but then disappears. And at this point, the mouse cannot produce a signal to the PC. Man, what a bummer. I really thought this one was going to work. Hopefully our stick of RAM can help even out the playing field. Upon closer inspection, again, I don't see any significant water damage. And so let's install it and power on. With our ice stick installed, this computer should be reading 12 gigs of RAM. Let's see what the software recognizes. Show me 12 gigs. Yeah. Here you can see 12 gigs of DDR3. Looks like our stick of RAM survived the ice as well. With that, we're now two for four. It's time to move on to the one that I think will be the biggest challenge, the hard drive. Hard drives are one of the few computer components that rely on mechanical moving parts, and for them to work properly, there needs to be a precise amount of space between the magnetic disks. Otherwise, the head that reads the disks won't be able to pick up any data. It just seems like this fragile ecosystem would surely be damaged by the water that's expanded when freezing. Well, let's find out. As we power on the system and inspect our computer's files, we can see that the hard drive is actually recognized. That's so crazy! But there it is, clear as day! One terabyte of storage! I legitimately thought this had a 0% chance of working after having not only water poured on it, but also having that water frozen within it. I went as far as creating some new files and folders within this hard drive, and honestly, it just kept doing its job. It kept working. <laughs> yeah, I'll be honest, I thought there was a 0% chance of this working. I honestly don't understand how the freezing water didn't disrupt the precise distance between the magnetic disks. But hey, the more you know. Last but certainly not least is our CPU motherboard and RAM combo. Right off the bat, this one has the most water damage by far. You can see all of this extra residue all over the board itself, and one of these heat sinks fell off when I was impatiently pulling this out of the ice. How does this translate into it's still working? Well, let's find out. I've got to say, I've built a lot of computers, and honestly, this is one of the worst motherboard layouts that I've ever interacted with. Check out where the motherboard and CPU power slots are. They're just like in the middle of the board. Typically, you'll find this over on the right-hand side and the CPU power up at the top, so you can easily plug them in. But for this one, nope, they're uh, right here. So thankfully, it's not too bad if you're not using a case. Because this system doesn't have integrated graphics, we're going to need a GPU. So let's just grab the one that we know works. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. And with that, we're ready to commence the final test. Will this PC still work after being frozen in ice? As we short out the power pins, we can see that the fans do end up spinning. But unfortunately, no matter how long we wait, there will never be a signal on this monitor. I'm not sure of its exact diagnosis, but I have a feeling that this motherboard has breathed its last breath. Perhaps some of that residue ended up shorting out some of the circuits, or perhaps the ice knocked some capacitors loose. Regardless, it ends up in the not working pile. Which brings our final total to three components that survived the ice, and three components that the ice destroyed. I hope you had as much fun as I did throughout this experiment, and if you'd like me to freeze any other specific computer components, let me know in the comments down below. As always, I'm Mr. Yeaster, your tech tinkerer, and I'll catch you in the next one.